This is a Talk Station original podcast. On this week's episode of the Paper Boys podcast, JJ and I interview the Dean of Eastern North Carolina Sports Anchors, Brian Bailey of WNCT9. He talks about his favorite moments over four decades of sports reporting in Greenville, how he started a career in journalism, and aspects of his personal life. It all starts right now on the Paper Boys podcast. <laughs> Hello and welcome to the Paper Boys Podcast. I'm J.J. Smith. And I'm Zach Nally. We're reporters with the Carteret County News Times. We are not joined today by our producer extraordinaire, Ross Carraway, but he'll make the sound smarter later, including cleaning that up right there. But we are joined by the Dean of Eastern North Carolina Sports Anchors, Mr. Brian Bailey. Thanks for being with us. Glad to be here. Thanks for having me. So am I right, Bailey? Uh, October this year is going to be 40 years yeah, we had to call uh, HR to find out exactly what the date was. It's October the 9th. October the 9th, 1984 was my first day at WNCT. When I say that, when, 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 we, when that number is mentioned, does that just blow you away? Yeah, it really does because, I mean, it seems like, you know, yesterday that, that I was, I can still remember my first trip to, to interview with uh, WNCT, and I remember passing by north pitt high school and thinking to myself that hey i might be you know covering that school one day and then you know i didn't know i'd cover them for 40 years but <laughs> I, I, I was hoping i'd get to cover them a little bit anyway but i still remember the first interview i still remember you know a lot of things about the uh the first time i walked in the station uh, a lot of times i will you know, I speak to a, a group at east carolina in communications classes and stuff and i'll take them through what i saw my first day as a reporter at wnct and uh, it was it was really fascinating. Yeah, I failed to mention Brian is with WNCT nine. Uh, what point did it start to hit you that you had been doing the job for a while? Was it one of those where you were covering the 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 the, the kids of athletes you had covered before? Yeah, I mean, a little bit of that. You know, people would come up and say, "Hey, my son was on channel." And I remember you you said my name on Touchdown Friday, <laughs> and now you're you're saying my son. And and heck, now I mean, it's going to be grandchildren pretty soon. I mean, we're, we're at the cusp of that. you got multiple uh, you generations. Know, Robert, Robert Jones is a good friend of mine and a former linebacker with the Cowboys, played at East Carolina, and his son Zay, of course, the all-time receptions leader in NCAA history and played at East Carolina. And, right. you know, when Zay has a child, and I'll be covering him. So, uh, but, but, yeah, it's, 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 been a, it's been a great ride. I mean, it's been a lot of fun and uh, I, I always tell people I got the best job in the world. A lot of people wake up and, and dread going to work. I wake up and say, "Hey, what's happening in sports today?" Oh, that's awesome. Uh, Bailey is. Oh, uh, does anybody, uh, just as an aside, call you Brian? Is there anybody left in the world who still calls you Brian? Mom does. My mom <laughs> does. <clears throat> My dad does. Uh, yeah, some some people do. Uh, yeah. It's funny how. My my wife Melissa, you know, when we started dating, you know, twelve years ago, for whatever reason, she started calling me Bailey, and she still calls me Bailey, and unless she's really mad at me. Then she gives the whole full thrust of every <laughs> name I've got. But but yeah, it, it's it's funny. I guess Bailey's just one of those names that can be a first name or a last name, and a lot of people just uh, just pick it up and and just use it as Bailey. All the anchors do the same thing on on the air. You know, they'll say thanks Bailey, and they'll they'll go about their next story. Some people just have that last name. We've got the West Carter athletic director here named Michael Turner, and I don't think oh, I've ever Mrs. heard of Turner. I've never heard of Saul call him Michael. I don't yeah. know. If, I don't know if his wife and kids call him, call, call him or his parent mom calls him Michael. That's yeah. There's just something cool about people who have last names that just have that, become that identity. Yeah. You know, I, I've always been jealous of that. Well, Bailey, as he's known, has been a longtime pal of the News Times Force Department. He's been on our. Uh, football pick and panel i looked it up last night it's been 15 years the 40 number you we just threw out blows me away that 15 blows me away as well wow, that blows me away too <laughs> i didn't realize we've been doing it that long no i had no idea we've been going back and forth via email for the past 15 years um bailey is uh running away making the rest of us look bad this year he's been uh out in front like secretariat from from the very beginning he's been like a five to ten game lead on the second place guy he's uh He's well in the lead. We've only got, what, seven games left, the divisional NFL round, the wild, the championship, conference championships, and the Super Bowl. So I think he could pick everyone wrong at this point and still win. Uh, what's, what's been the key to the victory this year? I probably will pick everyone wrong, too, now that you said that. <laughs> I, I think if you go back to the other 14 years, you'll find me somewhere near the bottom. <laughs> because, you know, it's, it's fun to pick games, but, uh, you know, I've always thought about you know some of the high schools, especially. You know, I'm sure there's a high school coach somewhere that's gone in the locker room before the game 
and said that such and such picked against you and got them fired up. But <coughs> it's just one of those, you know, it, it's fun to pick games. Uh, you never really know what's going to happen, and that's that's really the beauty of sports. Yeah, we've had a couple instances where coaches have told us they've used this as a locker room fodder. Yeah. So. Yeah, that, I'm that, sure. Well, you're you're being very modest. I I, looked, I I was keeping track there for a while. I think I've I've dropped the ball here the last few years, but uh, I was keeping a tally of every year, and I think you you tied Brian North in 2015 for the win. So you're you're you're, ah. you're, you're no stranger to the top spot. Hanging in there. That's good. <laughs> uh, quick little story on uh, the other the other B uh, sports anchor in the area, Brian North. Um, I was talking to him early on. When I, I think we were just starting to get to know each other oh, on a sideline on a Friday night. And Brian had a great line. He goes, uh, I think I was asking him how long he'd been doing it. And he said, well, I'm the, I'm the rookie of the Eastern North Carolina guys, and I've been here 28 years. And I just thought that was a, that was a great line. And I was like, well, uh, at some point, I think it, this is about five years ago maybe, I said, well, I'll do a story on those guys. They're not local, so you know, it's not, there's no really connection to Carter County. But they've been on the panel for, at that point, I guess it had been about 10 years, and, and North had been – at uh, WCTI 12, I think it was almost 30 at that point. You were like 35 at that point. Billy Weaver at WITN 7, I think he was uh, just a couple, like six months ahead of Brian North. I was like, man, that's great. That's, those guys have all been around this long. And So I get up with Brian North. We talked for like an hour because he's been doing it for 30 years, so there's plenty to talk about. I talked to Bailey for an hour. I tried to get a photo of the three of them together. That was like herding cats. Finally after, <laughs> finally, after months, we got a photo of them together. I'm trying to get up with Weaver. These guys were all super busy. You know, finally, we get it, you know, scheduled that we're going to do it. And then Weaver leaves Channel 7. Yeah. And so that's, that, story that's never, that story never sees the light of day. Well, we could, we, I, I call North a traitor because he went to news. Oh, at right. One point. So, yeah, so he – but but he does – tell you what, man, he does a really good job. He, he's been a, a good friend and – uh, you know, we're all battling each other. You know, on a Friday night, and those are the most fun, especially when, when Weaver was around and, you know, North's around. And I swear, I'd come up on a Friday night after high school football, and you know, I'd watch my show, and I'd grade my show and say, okay, we did this. And I'd watch North, and I'd watch Weaver, and, you know, just try to say, hey, I did this right, did that right. They did this better than I did. I did this better than they did. So but it's always just great competition. How wild was that to look around? After 30 years, and it's the same three guys. It was it was crazy because it was, um, you know, you don't really expect that, especially in this market because, you know, this is, you know, we we don't really, we don't really think of it as a starter market. We we try to hire reporters with a little bit of experience, but but you know, there's just so much money that goes goes around, and most people can't, you know, can't stay here long because you know the money's just not that great. They want to move up to Greensboro, to Raleigh, you know, to Charlotte, and make more money and. You know, it's more expensive to live in those places, but you can, you know, make a living that way. I was just very fortunate when I was coming along that I knew from day one that the money wasn't very good, but I asked to do other things, and I got a radio show in town. I've been able to write a newspaper-type column for the Internet for a while. I'm, uh, you know, I do a lot of work with pirate radio on the side, and, and Channel 9 has been, you know, gracious enough to let me do that. And It's kind of a, a trade-off because I'm always promoting WNCT when I'm on pirate radio, and so it's kind of a, you know, a, a win-win type situation there. And uh, it's just been great. I've got great sponsors. I've got, uh, you know, great support around the area. So uh, I've, I've, I've thoroughly enjoyed it. A lot of people ask me now, I'm 61 years old, and they say, when are you going to retire? And I say, I hope never because I got it, I got it made right now. So <laughs> just got to keep on keeping on. Is TV like the newspaper business, Brian? Do you have, uh, do you have the short timers and the long timers and really nobody in between? Yeah, pretty much. I think that's a great way to put it because, uh, you know, a lot of people get in this business and, and we see them from, from interns and, and then they get a job and then, you know, their eyes are wide open and they, once they realize it, you know, it's a lot of hard work to start, not a lot of money to start. It's frustrating sometimes. Uh, and, and the TV business has taken its lump. The newspapers have taken its lumps. I mean, you know, but, but somehow we've been able to, to stay with it and it's something, you know, it's more than – than just you know going and getting a paycheck. It's it's more of something that we all enjoy doing and that we you know we look forward to. Like like you know right now we're in you know January February pretty soon we'll start working on the high school show again if we want to make any changes for the the, the logo if we want to make any changes to to what the uh, graphics look like and that kind of thing. 
at what point did you did you kind of get the sense that you were going to be one of these folks that was there for a long time? Because I'm I'm ten years in. Have I missed my window, Bailey? <laughs> am I stuck here forever? <laughs> yeah. I tell people sometimes I got a life sentence, but I, but I but I like that because you you know it's 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 just whatever you feel. And I think that I've seen a lot of people come through and they do it for a while and then. Then they just decide, hey, they're burnt out. They don't, you know, they want to do something different. And I think that's that's fine with, with some folks. I mean, you know, I, I've had very few days in my, you know, forty years, almost forty years of doing this, where I thought, man, I, I think I want to do something else because I've enjoyed. My, now, not not to say I haven't had bad days, and I've had I've had news directors, as I always say, can make or break you. Mm-hmm. And we're looking for a new news director right now, which I'm a little concerned about because. You know, some news directors come in, they want to change everything, and, and that can affect you. Some news directors come in and want to keep everything the same and support you. The last two news directors I've had have been the best two I've ever had. Oh, wow. So I've been very fortunate in the last seven, now ten years. Last ten years, I've had – I had a, a – a, a, uh, Stephanie Schultz was our news director, and I swear to you, I could go out and kill three people. She'd call me in the office and say, well, I know you didn't mean to do it. What happened? <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, the way, that's the way she looked at it. She just loved me, and it was, it was great for me. And then uh, Bernie Ritter took over for her, and he, was, he had ESPN experience. He was a producer there, and I knew he was either going to come in and change sports or he was going to come in and support it, and he supported it, you know, and just kind of took it to another level, and, he just left for an opportunity in Richmond, so now we're looking for a new one. But and North will tell you that that you know news directors can make or break you. I, I think the what it boils down to probably uh, Bailey is you know it's a uh, it's not a ton of money in the industry. The schedule is wonky, so a baseline level is people are going to have to love it to stick around, right? Yeah, that, that's what it comes down to, and, and it comes down to you, you know if you're trying to raise a family, then you obviously you have to make more money to raise that family and. And then you have to kind of juggle, you know, what you do at work with what you do with your family, and uh, you know. But but I think it can be done. I mean, I, I was when my daughter was coming along, I was coaching fast pitch softball on the weekends, going to tournaments and going all over, you know, South Carolina, Virginia, North as as north as Pennsylvania, uh, and I really enjoyed that. When I was coming along, I wanted to either be a sportscaster, a sports writer or a high school teacher and be a coach and, and coach, you know, high school football or, or something like that. And so I decided that uh, the TV might be the hardest of the three, so I would try that first, and then I would go from there. But uh, I got lucky coming down to Channel 9 and, and staying here for 40 years, almost 40 years. Wow. You're the type of person that knows the value of a dollar. You've worked hard for what you have, and you know how to make it last. Atlantic Glass & Mirror specializes in folks just like you, bringing new life to your home, your car, or even your boat. Why spend a fortune for a complete bathroom makeover when Atlantic Glass & Mirror can revamp your bathroom with a new shower door and a decorative mirror? Atlantic Glass & Mirror has so many money-saving services, from windshield replacement for your car or boat to replacing broken or foggy glass in your picture frames. And don't watch your money fly out those old windows when Atlantic Glass & Mirror can install energy-efficient windows that will save you money and transform the look of your home. Call Atlantic Glass and Mirror today at 252-222-4527. That's 222-4527. Atlantic Glass and Mirror in Moorhead City. We know all about value, just like you do. All right, let's take care of some football stuff. Uh, Mr. Bailey, like myself, is a sad sack Dallas Cowboys fan. And... uh, Cowboys kind of, uh, well, I, the, the words I want to use, I can't use right now and to, to air on the podcast, but uh, they were the only home team to lose this past weekend. Uh, two years ago, they were also the only home team to lose. Um, they are the first team to lose to a seven seed since they've b- busted, uh, bumped the teams up to seven teams in the playoffs. They were down, I think it was, what, 27 to nothing. Uh, just just an awful weekend for Cowboys fans. And then a couple of days later, you think, well, at least, if nothing else, we're, we're going to fire the coach and we'll have some excited, exciting. And no, they're going to keep the coach. So, Bailey, uh, how long have you been a Cowboys fan and where did this past weekend, the last few days, rank? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, this past weekend ranked way down there, I can tell you that. Uh, I became a Cowboys fan when I was a kid. Uh, I was probably, you know, eight, nine years old when I started really – maybe seven years old, really started watching it with my dad. And my dad was a Colts fan, and 
I was a Cowboy, you know, fan. Just they just seem back when I was younger. This is way back. The Cleveland Browns would beat them every year. It seemed like, and they couldn't win the championship. And then they got into Super Bowl five, and the Baltimore Colts beat them on a last second field goal. And then Super Bowl six, they finally broke through. And I remember the NFL films when I was a kid. One one year it was next year's champions, the story of the Dallas Cowboys, and that's where I feel like they're at right now. I mean, I feel like, you know, every year it seems like they're next year's champions. I, I don't know what the answer is. I say I wasn't that upset when, when they decided to keep McCarthy because I think he's done a really good job in the regular season. I just think they need a psychiatrist or a psychoanalyst <laughs> or somebody to come in there because that, that game that game Sunday was just – it was just unbelievable that, that a team looked that bad. And, and Dak takes a lot of the heat, which he deserved on Sunday – but the defense couldn't stop him at all. I mean, the defense couldn't stop. You know, Jordan Love's a good quarterback, a you know, good young quarterback. But, man, I mean, he was just slinging darts back there, and Dallas didn't have an answer. And I think if Dak had played the game of his life, the Cowboys still might have lost because 100%, 100%. They, just, they couldn't stop him. And, yeah. and it's unfortunate. You know, I was just reading an article before we went on that some of the things the Cowboys have to – find an answer for and one of them is the running game they've got to get back to the running game where where people fear their run Dak's a much better quarterback when they're running the football and they really they, they weren't atrocious running the football this year but they were about the middle of the pack and they've got to be better than that for Dak to excel and and you know you could just tell on Sunday from the very beginning they just weren't into it and how can you not be into it all week long on the interviews you heard yeah we we've waited for this moment a long time we're gonna have a long playoff run we're and then to lay an absolute egg, as bad as the Eagles were Monday night, they still fought for a half. Dallas didn't fight at all, and that's that's what, that's the worst part, the most disappointing part. Bailey, when you watched that Super Bowl in 1995, if somebody was going to tell you the next 29 years they wouldn't even reach the conference championship, I don't, you probably wouldn't have believed them, would you? No, you're you're exactly right. I would have never believed them. No. Uh, there's no way that that would that would be you know that would hang true, but. Uh, I had a chance to go to Super Bowl 28. That was Dallas and Buffalo in Atlanta. That was a, a great, great time. That was unbelievable. And uh, you see your favorite team playing the Super Bowl because I don't know if I could go now if, if they ever made it again. I don't think I can afford it. it. It's crazy what it costs now. Right. Well, as a Carolina Panthers fan, I've got uh, no uh, – you guys can just suck it up and get over it. Um, we've had four straight losing seasons. And, you know, I, I, as sports commentators, reporters, we're supposed to look at things like championships and and legacy and, and what defines a, a franchise or a program's success. But I always, you know, as a fairly – you know, I can only be a casual fan to be a Panthers fan, but you – I just want something fun to watch, even if it's just the regular season. And uh, I think there are a lot of uh, NFL teams out there, franchises out there that would love the chance to to average nine and seven seasons, ten and six seasons, or whatever it is, seventeen games three, down. Three three twelve win seasons in a row. Yeah, I mean, yeah. like, <laughs> okay, it falls apart in the playoffs, but you get seventeen weeks of just like it's pretty good. We're we're we're, we're rolling, you know. We're doing, you know. I, a lot of teams would 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 kill to have that, but I understand the frustration after the success of those nineties. Yeah, and it's funny you say that because all year long this year, when I go into Pirate Radio and talk to those guys on my weekly show and. We talk a little NFL uh, on Mondays, and I, I'd say, look, you know, I'm not, I'm not really excited about the Cowboys. I mean, I like watching them play. I think they played a good game this week, but until you win in January, right now, you haven't done anything. And, and you know, unfortunately, I was right. Well, Bailey, I, I'm curious. You grew up in the Chesapeake, Virginia area. That was the, that's the heart of Was then the Washington Redskins country. How, how, how was it like being a Cowboys fan in that area? Yeah, it was, it was different. That, that's for sure. And I don't even know. You know, when you, when you say that, I remember, you know, watching the Colts with my dad and watching, you know, some of the football, but I never even thought about the Redskins as, as a favorite team. Or, or, and we got, the, we got every Redskin game because, we, you know, we were in that market. But it just, for whatever reason, uh, well, I know the big reason, Roger Stallback was just, just to me, a, a hero. He's one of the guys, he's one of the few people that, that I put on my hero list that I have not met yet. That I've, I've been uh. very fortunate to meet a lot of people in, my, in this business. But I've never met Roger Stallback, and I would love to. I got a jersey that he signed right here in my bonus room. I've got autographs from different things that I've, that I've purchased, or I've gotten gifts from people. 
but I've, I've never had a chance to meet him. But he's he's the reason. I remember I, I read his autobiography. I think it was, or his biography. I think it was Captain America, or, or something like that, years and years ago. And just you know, fell in love with Roger Stallback and the Cowboys. And uh, and and to be really silly, I'd go out. My parents would say, "What are you doing out there raking leaves?" I'd rake a big pile of leaves, and I would act like I was Calvin Hill jumping over the leaves to score a touchdown. <laughs> <laughs> they knew I wasn't raking the leaves to, to rake the leaves. But. Not to be a good son. Exactly. Well, uh, when it comes to football, it's been a, been a tough fall for Bailey. He's uh, you know, a Cowboys fan, which it was going well up until that playoff weekend. And also, as he's mentioned a couple times, you know, he's on the ECU, ECU radio network and he's got the Brian Bailey show. How, how long have you been doing that? Uh, we started the Brian Bailey show, and, and really we started as, I think it was called Sportsline or something like that. I didn't want to have my own name on my show. And then the, the next year we got ready to do it again. And they said, hey, let's just call it your show and get your name out there. And I thought, okay, I'll do it. And, and now it kind of has a ring to it, the Brian Bailey Show. Uh, we started that probably, I know we were doing it in 1991 because I've got a press clipping that uh, Steve Logan was my very first guest that year on the show. So I know, or 1992. The 1992 after the, the 91 season. So I know... When Bill Lewis left and Steve Logan took over, he was my very first uh, guest on my show that year. But uh, we've been doing it probably since '87 or '88, so oh, it's wow. got it's got legs too. Yeah, you, you get a you, like you said between that and the the writing of column stuff, you've been able to, to scratch a lot of itches when it comes to sports journalism, right? Yeah, I have been, and I've been able to learn a little bit about you know how to write and and, and you know how to you write for for this purpose and how to write for that purpose and. Because uh, it's a little bit different in different entities that you do. <clears throat> and in radio, you're kind of ad-libbing the whole time. In TV, we type out a script that we read on camera, and then we, we, we say we ad-lib the highlights. We, we type out information, and we kind of go with it. You know, especially on Friday nights, that, you know, when, when it's touchdown Friday in high school football, you really don't have a chance to see those scripts at all until you're on the air. So you're kind of flying by the seat of your pants but uh i've been able to you know scratch a bunch of itches that's that's the best way to put it i, I always put it i've been trying to grab money from different spots <laughs> that's, that's how you put it together and you make it well i was mentioning it's been a, it's been a rough football fall for bailey you know with the the cowboys not holding up their end of the bargain here this past weekend and then you know the ryan bailey show you all talking about ecu football every week and uh man uh <laughs> what a rough year i'm assuming in that 30 years you've had a show that's probably about as bad as it gets yeah, we've had some bad years, and we've had the John Thompson era, the Scotty Montgomery era. This one was different because, and I know there are some people out there they were, they were wanting to fire Coach Houston and that kind of thing. But I think that the most of the fans understood that that this was an anomaly. That, that this was just something different. There was it was just bad karma or bad mojo or something in so many different games. I mean, the defense played its tail off so much, and the offense just couldn't get going. I think. I think if Coach Houston, you know, he would say, "Hey, we we took a gamble on some things that didn't pan out, and they've they've done a 180 as far as that goes. They've got new players coming in. They really feel, and I believe it, that they feel like they can turn this thing around pretty quickly with the transfer portal. Now, and I'm not a fan of the transfer portal at all. I I think the NIL deals, you know, are not what they they were intended to be. Uh, I hope it changes at some point, but. I think East Carolina is on the way, and I think you'll see a much better football team, much better product on the field in 2024. I don't know if you had this experience this year, Bailey, but it seemed to me that I've never heard people be so fired up about an ECU football season for obviously the wrong reasons. And I think you kind of touched on it. I, I think it's unlike those Thompson and Montgomery years where I think maybe hope was lost at some point and never, never regained after last year and the kind of year they put together. Hopes were so high, so to have this year, I think – Fans were the you know Pirate Nation was really fired up about it. Yeah, and and, and rightfully so. I mean, the Pirate fans are, are are passionate. That's what makes them so great. Uh, nobody wants to go two and ten. It always cracks me up when everybody's so mad at it, at the coaches and, and and I'm I'm thinking like you know the people that really take it the worst are the coaches. I mean, when they they get by, I mean that's their livelihood. I think about assistant coaches all the time. I mean, they move their families around, you know, bounce around here and there and. Uh, it, it's a really a, a hard way, you know, to have a family. But uh, because if the coach gets fired, you know, then, then basically you're gone for the most part. So uh, it, it's it's very difficult. And a year like that just wears on you. You know, two and ten, they lost games. You know, just close games. 
uh, in, in ways you, you never think you can lose a game. And, and they just found a way. Some, thing, some teams found a way to win. That particular team somehow found a way to lose. But I still think that they've done some great things in the portal. And I'm looking forward to spring football because we've got two quarterbacks in here we've never seen before. Uh, we get a chance to see some new players. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. What's the, what's the second most sport you talk about on, on their radio program? Is it, is it the baseball program? Yeah, probably so. I, I mean, you know, basketball ball gets a, a lot of mention, but, you know, b- basketball has, has struggled so mightily, you know, all these years. And I think Mike Schwartz is an excellent coach. They lost a heartbreaker last night. Oh, man. Uh, but they, but they, they played really hard last night, and they've, they've got some, some parts. And I, I like Mike Schwartz. I like working with him with the coaches show. And uh, he's very, very intense. I mean, just goes after it all the time. Uh, but baseball, you know, I've got kind of a special relationship with Coach Godwin. I mean, he, I, I watched him. I covered him when he played quarterback at Green Central High School. Watched him as a player. You know, I kept up with him when he was an assistant coach and, and bouncing around the country. And, and then I was, you know, very much a, I called his dad about 100 times right before he got hired trying to get some information to see if he had accepted the job, the job or not. Because I had his phone number. He wasn't answering. And his dad wasn't answering. I knew something was up. But uh, he's, he's, he's just done a great job with that program. And, and East Carolina fans have a lot to be proud of. You know, when you, you're in the preseason and you're ranked, you know, you're ranked right up by there with East, with North Carolina, North Carolina State, you know, Duke. You know, Wake Forest is number one in the two polls I've seen so far. But uh, that, and that's what that's what East Carolina fans want to be in every sport. You know, they they, and rightfully so, they want to compete with the states and the Carolinas and and the ACC. You know, and, and all the teams. I mean, this state is loaded with college baseball. You know, you you get off the beaten path and you go down to Wilmington or Elon and uh, you know all, all these other teams that, that are really good too, and they. They, they want to be just like Carolina State and East Carolina. So it, it's, it's a great state for baseball. For over 40 years, Floyd's Auto Body has been the collision repair specialist on the Crystal Coast. Floyd's has consistently kept up with the latest modern technology, so our highly trained technicians can bring you top quality auto body solutions while never straying from Floyd's promise to get you back on the road without any hassle. Floyd's Auto Body's unequaled commitment to customer service means you can get a free estimate and all of our work is backed up by a lifetime warranty. And remember, if you're in an accident, by law, you have the right to choose your collision repair specialist. And the smart choice is Floyd's Auto Body Shop. Floyd's is located next to the Flea Mall entrance on Highway 70 in Newport, and they'll be glad to answer your questions by taking your call at 252-223-4723. If you're in an accident, there's no need to stress. Call Floyd's Auto Body Shop in Newport, your friend in the business since 1979. All right, as we mentioned before, Bailey grew up in the Chesapeake, Virginia area. He's an Indian River High School grad. Let's, let's give some of Brian's bona fides here. He's the TV Sportscaster of the Year by the Radio Television Digital News Association of the Carolinas in 2019 and 2020, 2021. He's a 22 time award winner. By the North Carolina Associated Press, he was named the Professional Broadcaster of the Year by East Carolina University in 88. He was inducted into the George Whitfield Hall of Fame in 2023. He's been honored by the Raleigh Hot Stove League, the Pitt Greenville Hot Stove League, the North Carolina High School Baseball Coaches, North Carolina Special Olympics, Pitt Greenville Special Olympics, and by the City of Greenville for Community Service. So he's done a thing or two. He knows a thing or two. So when you were growing up in Chesapeake, Virginia, you graduated from Indian River High School, with sports, your life, or you saw I'm going to do something to do with sports. Yeah, I think so. I think you know I, I played high school football, and it, it's funny that uh, you know I'm 61 years old, and I, I, I still think back to, to days practicing football, days you know two a days in the summertime we used to have, and and just just the respect that I had for the coaches, and uh, I, I don't know. It's just it's something that stuck with me. I think it's the reason that we put so much time and effort in Touchdown Friday because, you know, they didn't have that back then uh, when when we were coming along. So I, it's just been something that that I really, really, really enjoyed. You know, playing and uh, I didn't. I played some baseball in the little league level and stuff, but I wasn't as good as all my buddies were. So I, I, I conned my way onto the baseball team as a scorekeeper, so I could go on the trips with them and that kind of thing. So I enjoyed doing that, and uh, and we didn't have like you know a, a 
a uh, newspaper for the for the school or anything like that, that I could work on. But we did have a uh, part of my high school was at a radio station. Uh, it was at the Chesapeake Technical Center. I had three hours my junior and senior year over there. I had my own radio show, and uh, <laughs> it's a funny part. The, the, my radio show it was an hour long, and it was you know you playing music and stuff, and it was all you know top forty type stuff at the at the time, and they would record it from uh, eleven to twelve a.m. and play it back from five to six. So it was during football season, and all the guys were you know we're just laying around the locker room waiting to get dressed, waiting to you know warm up. You know, we play at seven thirty, so I got the stereo and I put it on the radio station that it was on. I said, hey fellas, you got you got to hear me on the radio. So. All the guys were gathered around, and I, I did, you know, I used to call myself the Big B back then. I was in high school. The Big B on uh, 94.3, blah, 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 you know, nice. doing it like that. Well, the song came on, gone. I was introducing it, and I, I said, this is Chick. And it wasn't Chick. It was Chic. And all the guys knew it was Chic except me. Oh, no. And I called him Chick. And those guys cracked up and laughed and I swear, I don't even think we, we played the first quarter that night. They were still laughing. <laughs> I, had, I had screwed up the group. Uh, but but they, they were fun times. Learned a lot uh, about radio stuff back then, way back then. And then um, somehow parlayed that into college and then getting the job with uh, WNCT. You go to Old Dominion University. You get a degree in speech communications. At that point, you were well on your way. You knew that some way, some shape or form, you were going to do sports journalism. Yeah, and, and it's, it's, it's interesting. I, I went my freshman year to Old Dominion, but I really wanted to go somewhere else. I didn't get in to UVA, and I applied to James Madison in Harrisonburg for my sophomore year, and I got in, and I went up there. And because I was a, a, mid, a transfer, you couldn't live on campus. You had to live off campus. So I was really like a fish out of water because I couldn't hang out with anybody. I couldn't, you know. I had some friends there from high school, but I couldn't. They were in the dorms, and I was living off campus, and I couldn't drive here and there, and so it really didn't work out. I was homesick, so I decided to come home my for my junior year, and I got a job, and it was it was sell. Believe it or not, it was selling wire rope to construction firms and stuff like that. I didn't know a thing about any of that, but I got my own little truck that I got to drive around in. So I made the decision not to go to college at night and work during the day, which was a terrible decision. But I, I made the decision, and I did it at first, and then I realized that, look, I don't want to sell this wire rope the rest of my life. i got to do something in sports. i got to do something. So then I started, you know, that, that one year, my junior year, I went to class at night, went to class whenever I could to try to get as many hours as I could because I wanted to get out in four years if I could. And then my senior year, I dedicated to just getting out, if I could, and graduating from Old Dominion. And I had 21 hours my first semester. I think I had 21 the second semester and busted it and got my degree and started my career. But it was a different path in college for sure. I think you're probably like uh, like some of us or maybe a lot of us, Bailey, in that uh... – you had a real job, and you said, I don't want to do that for a living, right? Right. That's exactly <laughs> right. And, and sometimes you have to, you know, people can tell you that all, the, all they want, but until you, you live it and you're like, man, you know, and, and like I said, you wake up in the morning. My dad always said, you know, you wake up in the morning and, and you're somebody. Who are you this morning? And for 40 years, I've been able to say I'm the sports director at WNCT so I can go to and do sports. But, yeah, that was a, that was a tough time. And I think well, that may be one of the reasons that I've stayed in Greenville so long because – I was such a fish out of water in Harrisonburg that I didn't want to have that feeling again. Once I got, you know, accustomed to everybody in Greenville and new people, and but I didn't know one person in Greenville, North Carolina, when I got here, and, and now I feel like I know just about everybody. You know, anybody around town, I can go and, and find something out from from anybody, just about because I've been doing it so long. Right, well, tell us about how you showed up at uh, uh, WNCT and uh, where where else you might have ended up. Well, when I was. <laughs> I was trying to get a job. I went to my dad. Now, everybody, you guys can relate to this. If somebody in TV wants a job, they, they do a, a, a demo tape, show what they can do, like a story or a stand-up or an anchor segment, and they put it on YouTube, and they send the news director an email with a link. And the news director clicks on the link and looks at it and decides if he wants to talk to you more or not. Well, back in the day, you had to put that on tape. 
And these tapes, they were three-quarter inch tapes, and they were like $75 a piece. And I didn't have you know any money graduating, so I asked my dad, and my dad said, how many tapes do you need? I said, well, I need at least probably three to start. And my dad said, well, you better find a job quick. Because <laughs> he wasn't coming up with any more $75 after that first trio of tapes. But uh, I was up for a job in Bristol, Tennessee, that I was going to take if they, they offered it. But I didn't get it. And then the other job I was offered next was in Greenville. And that seemed that seemed a lot closer. It was a lot closer to home and seemed like a, a better fit. And came down and interviewed. And um, I really thought it was a sports job. I really was, you know, my mom used to always say this, and my wife says it now, that you kind of hear what you want to hear. And I kind of thought it was more of a sports job. Actually, it was anchoring the Saturday sports and – uh, during the week, you had to do news and sports, which turned into mostly news to start. Doesn't but, always. <laughs> uh, and the news director said my salary would be eight nine, and I thought he meant eight dollars and ninety cents an hour, and which was not very good. But I thought, well, if it's this and this, and then I went back to him, and he said it's eight thousand nine hundred dollars per year. I said, what's that per hour? And he said, it's minimum wage, four dollars and ten cents. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, really? <laughs> but I took it because I asked my dad, and my dad, first thing he said was, uh, well, son, did you tell him you had a degree? And I said, yes, sir, it was on my resume, but that's what they offered. And he said, well, if you think you can live off of it, he said, I'll try to help you if I can, but you know, you're a man now. You need to figure out a way. And so wow. that's what we did. We figured out a way. And, and people think those sports anchors are making all the big bank, right? Yeah, and it was. I, I was like, "Whoo!" And I remember the uh, right after that when I got the sports director's uh, position because I was working under a guy, and he 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 moved on a year and a half later. And then the first three years that I worked, I made sixteen one, sixteen four, and sixteen seven. I think were the three numbers. Wow. And then our general manager came to me and said, "I need to get you under a contract." Um, how's 18, 21, and 24 sound? And I was like, heck, heck yeah, man, I'm a millionaire now. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, but it's been, it's been, they've been very fair to me through the years, and it's, it's been great. Well, what were those early years like compared to what they're like now? I, I'm, assuming, I'm assuming it's just a little bit different. Uh, yeah, it's a lot different. You know, the, the camera's different. You used to carry around a big deck. Um, you know, I was fortunate. I've always, I've always thought that the internship program is very important. And so I've always tried to have at least one or two interns per semester because that's how I got my start. You know, when I was in college, I interned at the NBC affiliate, interned for a guy named Bruce Rader in Norfolk, Virginia. He just retired recently. And a, a guy by the name of John Castleberry was doing weekends. Castleberry was actually the sports director at uh, WITN for a while, and then he moved up to norfolk to be the weekend guy it kind of shows you you know he could make more money as a weekend guy in norfolk than he could as a sports director in our market at the time and then he uh he helped me a, a lot and he worked for roy hardy who was the news director at itn who moved over to nct he called roy on my behalf and that's when roy hired me and i got this started so it's all it's all people networking really what, what's your thoughts on the future of sports journalism? I know there's a lot of discussion these days, both TV and newspapers. Are you optimistic, pessimistic? I try not to be pessimistic, but in some ways, you know, you almost have to be. The worry is that that a lot of a lot of consultants have always told the news people that sports is not important. That and some some news stations have gone away from sports. I mean, you look at what in our heyday in this market. We had three people at one time. We had a, we had me. We had a, a weekend person. We had a third person doing sports stories and stuff. Uh, ITN had two people full time, and CTI had two people full time. And now we're fortunate enough to have two people full time. ITN has one person full time. I believe CTI has one person full time, but they're helped out a lot with with North helping out when he, when he can. But it's just you know, and I don't understand. You know why it's like that. Uh, Next Star does have um, a news director type manual, and in the news director manual, they do say that they really support local sports and they want us to do local sports, which I'm, you know, 100% behind. You know, I always, I always say, 
you know, it's kind of like a pyramid for our local sports. Our local sports is the local high schools and East Carolina University because that's where we're, at, we're here. And then it branches out to, you know, regional sports, the Atlantic Coast Conference with State and Duke and Carolina. Uh, you know, NASCAR is a regional sports for us. Uh, the Panthers and the, and the Hornets. And, you know, it kind of branches out from there. Uh, and, and what we are, our, our shortcoming may be that we just don't do as many sports features as we should. You know, we, we, we struggle with that because we try to do such a good job on the day to day, you know, of what's going on. For example, today, you know, the big story last night, East Carolina lost 60 to 59 on a last second shot, heartbreaking loss. Last night, we show the highlights of the game and hear from Coach Schwartz. Tonight, we'll break it down and just, show maybe the last play you know rj felton drives in hits a jump shot pirates up by one with three seconds left north texas throws the ball the length of the court you know the guy catches it underneath the basket and lays it up pretty much at the buzzer and the pirates lose by one and we analyze the play and uh and and go through it that way but there's also some ways you know you could you could if you have a game like that especially when they win people are more likely to talk and have fun then you can you know, maybe do a feature the next night. You don't have to show the exact plays. We try to mix things up and make the 5 o'clock sports different than the 6 o'clock. Some days you can't really do this. There's nothing going on, but, but sometimes, most times you can. Temperatures rise and temperatures fall. But one thing that doesn't change is our commitment to keeping you comfortable. At Carteret Heating and Cooling, that's been our mission for over 30 years. That's why we install, service, and repair the best names, like Train. Make sure you're prepared for whatever weather comes your way with a dependable train system from Carteret Heating and Cooling. Because it's hard to stop a train. Carteret Heating and Cooling, keeping Eastern Carolina comfortable for over 30 years. Bailey, 40 years, I know it's going to be hard, but uh, man, some of the top athletes you've covered, some of the top games you've covered, what what really stands out to you? You know, one of the biggest thrills I've ever had was uh, playing golf with Michael Jordan in 2000 at the Michael Jordan Celebrity Golf Classic. He um, he had a, a tournament for several years. Excuse me. And he um, the, in 2000, uh, the, the organizers came to me and said, "Hey, can you um, can you be at the, at the pairings party? We got a surprise for you." And I was like, "Yeah, I'll be there for sure." And and when they put the pairings up on the big board, it was Michael Jordan and Brian Bailey together. And I thought, "Oh my goodness!" And I, I think it was just a, a thanks to me for covering them for so many years and. Uh, you know, playing with Jordan. Jordan walked up the first tee, and he says, all right, boys, we're playing for $1,000 a hole. And I thought to myself, man, by the third hole, I'm going to be out of money. <laughs> yeah, I just no way I can keep up with this, this crowd. <laughs> but then he was just joking, and we had a, we had a really good time. And uh, it, was, it was a lot of fun. But, but it was at a time before everybody had cell phones. And everybody had pictures. So there are very few pictures out there of me playing golf with Michael Jordan, which is really crazy. There's there's one where Ronald McDonald was there standing on the green, and I'm putting, and Jordan's watching me putt. (laughs) It's kind of a cool picture. But, uh, yeah, that's that's probably, you know, I had a chance to meet Tiger Woods, which which was really neat. Uh, Jordan was still number one as far as that goes. Uh, I had a chance to meet Tom Landry, uh, the former coach of the Cowboys, who was one of my heroes as a kid. I got a call. Uh, one night about 10 o'clock at night, and the guy said, I, I want to invite you to a breakfast in the morning at 7.30 in the morning in Rocky Mount. It's our Fellowship of Christian Athletes. And I, I said, well, bud, I work till midnight. I, I, I can't go to a breakfast at 7.30. He said, well, the guest speaker is going to be Tom Landry. And I said, I'll see you at 6.30. <laughs> and so, so we went and, and got to interview Tom. That was such a thrill. Uh, Joe Gibbs came to town uh, several, about, about maybe six, seven, eight years ago. And he, he came to town. We went to the. It was a full fellowship of Christian athletes, and we went and met him to do an interview with him. And he got in front of this crowd. It must have been seven, eight hundred people there. And he got in front of the crowd, and he said, "We've had a difficult time getting here. We were supposed to fly in this morning, but the weather was bad last night, so we decided to drive in. We didn't get here until midnight. We got up at five thirty to come over here. And the first guy that interviews me is a cowboy fan. <laughs> Everybody cracked up because they knew it was me." <laughs> Man, back in the day, you all went everywhere, right, Bailey? You, you mentioned going to a Super Bowl. You, you talk, mentioned going from as you know, low as uh, uh, South Carolina and Georgia, Florida, whether it was Pennsylvania. You, you all weren't scared to get on a plane or a bus and go somewhere back in the day. 
Yeah, we were able, we were fortunate enough to to be able to do some some things like that, and you know when the budget's crunched, you know that kind of takes some of that out. But still, still really fortunate to uh, get to travel with the ECU football team on those trips, and, and they're such business trips. I mean, you get on the plane on Friday, uh, you get in there Friday afternoon, you eat dinner, you get up Saturday and go to the game and cover the game, and then come back late Saturday night. That's a that's a thrill for me. That's a, that's a lot of fun. Um, but it's something that I've really enjoyed. We've, we've only done that for the last four or five years, uh, but that's, that's, been, that's been great. And then even before that, we try to go to as many away games as we possibly could that we, we get in the budget. I usually go to Clearwater, Florida for the baseball tournament every year. Uh, that's a lot of fun. It's always hot down in Clearwater, but D.C. baseball is so good, and those games are, you know, and then the regionals and the super regionals. And, you know, I went to Vanderbilt one year with, with the super regional for East Carolina. Uh, so it's, you know, it, it's I've, I've been blessed to, to go to some places. What's a what's a couple of games where you've been uh, covering them on the sidelines and just kind of got some goosebumps and and you know come to yourself and said I you know I can't believe I get to do this for a living. Super Bowl thirty eight was like that because I was able to be on the field for the Panthers and the Patriots and the Patriots and the Panthers played so well in that game and it was you know they it was nip and tuck it was a great game uh, being on the sideline because the NFL took that. Uh, Thing that, that being able to shoot games on the field away from local affiliates oh. now, like if you go to a Panther game, uh, the, the Charlotte markets can can shoot on the field, and I think they get three other ones. So like the, you know the Greensboro Station, one of those, or Raleigh, or but you know we, we we would never get to do that again. But back then we could. So that was that was one of those you pinch yourself and say, man, I can't believe you know all these millions of people watching the Super Bowl, and I'm watching it right here, you know and that was the uh, wardrobe malfunction as well. Oh. So I was I was there for that. So nice. that was that was a, that was a, that was a neat deal. <laughs> a little uh, bonus for you. <laughs> yeah, the Peach Bowl and you know the 1992 you know, January 1st 92 Peach Bowl right. and East Carolina came from 17 down to beat NC State, the greatest win in East Carolina Fire football history. That was that was unbelievable to be there. Uh, there's, there's been a lot of them that you no you kind of just look around. I, I still want to go to to the College World Series. You know, that's that's on my bucket list, but I don't want to go unless East Carolina goes, which I think they will one of these days. Uh, the Little League World Series, both times Greenville took a team there. They were they were great trips. I mean, you know, Williamsport is really a cool place uh, for Little League baseball, and, and doing that, they were they were great trips. Uh, Bailey, a few months ago, we all kind of got a little bit of a shock. We're used to. Bailey with that, you know, flowing gray hair, and we see a photo of Bailey with his head shaved, and you had a, a, a release about your health. Tell us uh, how you're doing these days. Well, I was, I was diagnosed uh, with prostate cancer stage four back in July, and it was a scary time. I mean, it was, it was one of those things where I knew it was treatable, but when it, when it goes to stage four, it gets more serious, and uh, so I had to do a couple of rounds of chemo, and uh, the chemo gave me diverticulitis, which is a, a thing in your gut that just kills you. And I was in a hospital for 10 days. And oh, wow. It was a dark time uh, this fall because the fall is a, the greatest time in the world for a sports guy, especially this sports guy. Um, but we, we, we started treatment. We, we got with some doctors at Duke, and uh, we just did everything they told us to do. And... Uh, on December 21st, we had a full body scan, and they said that my cancer was 99.9% in submission and that they were extremely pleased and they think they can keep me around for a lot longer. So wow. in a nutshell, that's, uh, that's how that went down. But it was, you know, it, it was a scary, scary time. And it's just you hear the C word, and, and you know, some people don't have a chance. And it's, it's, it's so sad. I was lucky that, that you know, I was given a chance, and so far it's worked out. It, things can change tomorrow, but, you know, you try to have a good attitude with it and try to keep moving forward, but it was, it was a scary time. That's awesome. Bailey, you, you've really served uh, your community well, not just on the job, but, but off the job. You've been on the board of directors for the Greenville chapter of the Cal Ripken Senior Foundation. You worked with Bo's Buddies, a cancer awareness group, and with Special Olympics in Pitt County. You served as an MC for the Walk to Defeat ALS and other area fundraisers. Uh, you coached the Carolina Diamonds, a fast pitch travel team. You coached WNC TV in the Exceptional Community Baseball League for special needs children. You're an advisory board member in the ECBL. 
you've got a stepdaughter with Down syndrome. Did were were you this um, you know active? before she came into your life or did she kind of spur this engagement no it, it's one of those things that kind of it kind of just came along I, I wasn't comfortable at all with anything that was different when i got here uh drew Steele, mike Steele's son uh over at east, you know he was a basketball coach at east carolina drew is is a, is a mainstay he's an icon around greenville and east carolina university and I've known him most of all of his life, and he has Down syndrome. And, and just, you know, working with him a little bit, he got me involved in Special Olympics. And so whenever I went on a blind date with Melissa, my wife, and they, they had told me her daughter has, you know, Down syndrome. And I was like, man, how does that work? How do you handle that full time? But, you know, we went on a blind date. We enjoyed each other. We, we actually went our separate ways for about two or three years. And then we got back together and, uh, ended up dating and getting married. We've been married 11 years now, but uh, it, it's it, it's just a it, it's a trip. I mean, you know, it, uh, sometimes you know somebody will say, "Well, what if Bella didn't have Down syndrome?" And I say, "Well, if she didn't have Down syndrome, she wouldn't be Bella." I mean, she comes up with some of the craziest things. She's got the best personality, but on the other hand, she can be as grumpy as anybody <laughs> in the world. Uh, you just never know what you're going to get. But it's been a godsend for me. I mean, I, I think she needed. Me and her life, and I needed her in my life, and it's been good. Well, Bailey, we're so grateful for the 40 years of service you've given to uh, Eastern North Carolina and for the being a pal to us for the past 15 years on our panel and for joining us here today, and so glad to hear you're doing so well. Thank you so much. Well, we appreciate it. Thanks for having me. It was a lot of fun. I'm Ryan Kelly. I'm Lynn Schultz. And we're the hosts of the Senior Moment Podcast. Each week we bring you conversations with experts right here in our community about the common and uncommon challenges facing our aging population and caregivers. We discuss the challenges of caring for a loved one with dementia, as well as the importance of health planning, family history, and much more. Join us every week for Senior Moment, streaming now on Spotify, YouTube, and at carolinacoastonline.com.